Hi, Gad. Uh, so I will get to uh, Meta GTAs today, but uh, I want to say first and say a few general things, and then say a little more about the GTAs before I start the Meta GTAs. I'll have time to discuss the Meta GTAs more in my research talk, so, so I will will cover them pretty well. Um, so uh, first of all, a, a sort of general comment about what we can get from a practical code champ calculation in the proxy function. Uh, we can hope to get the, the ground state energy and the ground state electron density. And we shouldn't really expect to get anything else from a code champ calculation except those quantities and quantities that are related to them. But but those quantities are still very important because when you know when you can calculate the ground state energy, you can calculate ground state energy differences. There are many possible uh, properties that come out of those ground state energy differences. Uh, and when I, when, I, when I gave my uh, second talk yesterday, I showed the Jacob ladder of, of uh, approximate functionals, and I showed an accuracy of the functional increasing as you go up the ladder. And I want to say a little more about that because accuracy is a statistical concept. There are many, uh, many systems that you, can, that you can build up from atoms. There are almost endless uh, possibilities for molecules and solids, so there are many possible systems uh, coming from you know, the 100 or so elements in the periodic table. And there are also many properties of those systems that you can calculate from just the ground state energy and the ground state electron density. And so if you want to determine whether a function is accurate or not, you have to test it uh, on particular systems for particular properties. And so you have a data set, and typically in that data set you get a mean absolute error from each functional. And uh, then you can say one function is more accurate than another if it has a smaller mean absolute error. But of course that's going to depend on the data set. And so the only way you can avoid that problem is to just test it on as many systems and as many properties as you can. Uh, and even if a fun functional has the smallest mean absolute error, there will be cases where it's not as accurate as other functionals that have larger uh, mean absolute errors, right? Because accuracy is a statistical concept uh, in density functions. There are also a wave function. Something that's you comparing to? Uh, comparing uh, the accuracy of one functional to another. So, so let's let's say we have an experimental result or a a uh, high-level theoretical result, like a quantum Monte Carlo result. We take that as the reference. Then we take the functional prediction, uh, and the difference be for a particular functional, the difference between those two is the error. The absolute value of that error is the, is the absolute error, and then you can average that over all of the uh, properties in your, in your data set. And that gives this number. And in many papers, you'll see that the mean absolute errors are reported for different functions. Now, in the, uh, for, the, for the systems and properties that we have looked at so far, I can say very roughly that and this is a very rough number, uh, but sort of typical number, I guess. The, the mean absolute error of LDA, LSDA. Is uh, maybe twice the mean absolute error, two or three times the mean absolute error of uh, EGA, and the mean absolute error of GGA is maybe two or three times larger than the mean absolute error of the 
you shouldn't take that too seriously because it's just a generalization from a lot of numbers. Uh, what, what you can see, however, is that statistically at least there's an overall improvement in accuracy as you go up the ladder from GGA to <coughs> um, uh, from LDA to GGA and then from GGA to meta GGA. Uh, now, <coughs> how important is accuracy? After all, the LDA is not terribly wrong for, for many things, right? Uh, particular if you're calculating uh, atomization energies, uh, it's, you know, it makes like a 10, 20 percent error. It's not so bad. So is it really important to do so much better? Well, actually it is. For certain problems it is. Because even a very small uh, error in the total energy uh, the air, the air and total energy can be quantitatively small and still it can have an important qualitative effect. Let me give you an example. Suppose you want to predict the ground state crystal structure of a solid. So you calculate the uh, ground state total energy of the different crystal structures of the functional energy. And you, say, you predict that the, the correct ground state crystal structure, the observed one at zero temperature, is uh, a particular structure. But typically, there are other structures that are very close in energy. Uh, and so small energy errors can make a big qualitative uh, error of prediction. You can predict the wrong crystal structure. Uh, we have looked at about 200 solids, uh, including some difficult ones with transition metal atoms. And, and uh, for that data set, we find that, that the uh, the PBGGA predicts the ground state crystal structure about 75% of the time, and 25% of the time it predicts the wrong structure. If you, if you reduce the error in the energy by about a factor of two, which is typically what you get if you go to a, a good meta GGA like SCAN, you, you also reduce the error prediction rate from 25% to maybe 12%. So, so, so if you're if you're interested in a property that is sensitive to small errors in the energy, then, uh, then these, these, uh, this accuracy is an important issue. Okay. Uh, so, so let's uh, let's let's finish up what we were saying about the generalized gradient approximation. So, so. Uh, one way to look at the exchange energy in the generalized gradient approximation is to write it in the following way. Where uh, S is a dimensionless or reduced density gradient, ln over 2, 3 pi squared n to the 1 third times n. <coughs> this is called a reduced density gradient. How do I know that uh, the GGA uh, for exchange has to take this form. Well, it, it can only depend on N and ln. And it has to uh, obey the correct Levy uniform scaling condition. And this is actually the only possible form, the only possible form for an exchange GGA. And there has to be something here that we call an enhancement, an exchange enhancement. which tells you how much the exchange energy is enhanced or de-enhanced, but typically it's enhanced, over the LDA. So this part is LDA exchange. And this enhancement factor tells you how much the exchange energy is, is uh, deepened or enhanced by uh, the, the gradient curves. So that, I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Exercise. Show that 
was satisfies uniform density scales. So any sensible GGA, wherever it comes from, empirical or not empirical, whatever whatever the construction basis is, it should it should have this form. There should be an exchange enhancement factor, which is only a function of this reduced density gradient. What does that enhancement factor look like? Well, I'll plot fx of s as a function of s. And here's zero. Uh, typically, the most important values of s in a, a system built up from atoms are between zero and three. It's dimensionless number, so no units. And uh, on the vertical axis, let's see, I'll put a one, one here and a two up here. Uh, now the LDA enhancement factor is just one, right? because if I put a one in here, uh, I recover the local density approximation for exchange. What does a GGA look like? Well, let's let's take the PVE as an example. It starts out uh, from one because it has to recover the the uniform gas limit for exchange but has to start out from one. It typically has an S squared behavior because it's going to mimic the gradient expansion in some sense. It comes up. And in the PVE case, saturates around 1.8. So this is, this is PVE. And what this uh, what this tells you immediately is that is that the uh, density and homogeneity, which is measured by S, makes the exchange energy more negative. <clears throat> so, uh, so what are some of the effects, the typical effects of the generalized gradient approximation? Uh, we mentioned the other day that. Uh, <coughs> LDA overbinds, LDA overestimates binding energies. I mean, let me write it again. LDA uh, errors. It's actually LSA. Uh, we really always use the spin density dependence in our calculation. Uh, the uh, magnitude of EXC. So the value of the EXC too small, except for uniform densities. Uh, and uh, we have uh, overbinding, <coughs> overestimation of binding energies. We have underestimation of quantum delivery quantum. I don't know. What it, I'm just going to guess roughly a typical number here is 20%. A typical number here is 2%. Don't rely on that too much. This is only very rough. Uh, and now, uh, when we introduce the GGA, we get uh, magnitude of EXC about right. Much more realistic. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking about real systems built up from atoms now, molecules, solids, and so on. Uh, we, we get an overestimate, a typical. Uh, Mostly overestimation of, of uh, binding energies. But it's reduced by a factor of two or three, so it might be 10% now. 
And we get uh, an over, actually we get an overestimation. This, this came up before, this was mentioned uh, before. We get an overestimation of bond lengths. So the correction overshoots. Depends a, uh, a lot on what you look at, but typically 1%. Okay, so errors are going to have by maybe a back to two, but they can just mean absolute errors or mean relative to mean absolute relative errors in some sense. <clears throat> anyway, there's an improvement, and there will be a further improvement. Uh, these errors will be further reduced by another factor of two or three when we get to the meta now, <coughs> question. To me, it seems a bit weird that we uh, overestimate the dynamic energy but underestimate the bond length. Because generally, a strong uh, bond is going to be short and vice versa. Yes. So, uh, 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 like, am I missing some aspect? Like, uh, or, or is it really slightly weird? Like, what is it due to? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's, it, it is slightly weird. It's, it's a little counterintuitive. And, and what it's really due to is the fact that, uh, well, uh, there are different ways to look at it, but, but I think uh, the way I look, look at it now is that the GJ is a very limited functional form. It's still very simple because it just uses two ingredients, N and del N. And uh, we can get the, we can, there are various ways we can get this enhancement factor. Uh, actually, in, in PBE, there are two ways. I'll talk about both of them. They happen to agree in PBE, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is correct. Uh, if you want to get uh, more realistic, if, if, you, if you weaken this density dependence, for instance, if you, if you did something like this, this might be PBE salt. That's a PBE for solids. And what that typically does is it makes the bond lengths very accurate, or the lattice constants very accurate. And it overbinds more than, uh, uh, more than uh, the PBE, but less than LDA. So, so the, everything in, in GGA is very sensitive to, to this exchange enhancement factor. And I think that, that I have reasons to believe that, there's, that this exchange enhancement factor is not really reliable. No, but, but see, my question was, even just at the LSDA level, like uh, how come that we overestimate the uh, bond energy, but we underestimate the bond length? Because in, uh, in GGA, instead we overestimate both of them. It's, it's a bit weird that we overestimate one and we underestimate one, yeah. and when they are somewhat related, it can be yeah, yeah. this is This is a problem with GGA. This is a problem with the functional form itself. It's what we what we call the uh, um, well, there, there are various names for it. You call it the the uh, energy geometry dilemma of GTA. Uh, basically, uh, no one has found a, a single GTA that can be accurate for both quantities at the same time, for for binding energies and lattice constants. And so typically, and so if you find a typical GGA, if you make it too accurate for the binding energies, it will be very bad for the for the bond lengths of okay. vice versa. It's a limitation of the GGA form that will go away when you get to the better GGA. Just keep going for the end of this GGA. If you have a higher binding energy, then your bond length will be less. Yeah, actually, I was inverting the one right now. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I, I guess that the point is that what we are mis misvaluating is the relationship between bond and 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 yeah, yeah, and yeah. Bond that's energy. right. So they both come from a binding energy curve, quantum energy versus bond. That curve, you just can't make it perfectly right. Okay, <laughs> let me mention. But there are actually two derivations of PBE, and I only, only mentioned one of them yesterday. Uh, PBE has two derivations. And uh, the first one I told you about yesterday, and it's based on the, the whole constraints. It constraints on the exchange hole and on the correlation hole. Uh, but there's another, another derivation of the same functional.
leaves it almost the same functional numeric way and parameterized in the same way that we use it. Derivations. Uh, one is from the whole constraints. And in this range of s from zero to three, these two derivations give you almost the same, almost the same curve, but at, at larger s, which is not energetically very important, they give different uh, behaviors. And the second one is from the uh, constraints on the exchange correlation energy itself. A lot of those constraints were derived in the 1980s. Most of them were derived by Mel Levy. Uh, a few of them were derived by Elliot Lee. I derived a few of them. Uh, there's some other people as well who derived a few. Uh, altogether, uh, PV satisfies 11 exact constraints. Kieran, so Kim and Kieran and I worked on this. We made it satisfy 11 exact constraints. And, and we chose those constraints. <laughs> this is the, so there are more there are more exact constraints were known in 1996. About seven, uh, maybe 17 exact constraints were known, uh, or maybe 16 at that time. And uh, we couldn't satisfy all of them with the GGA form. So some exact constraints, some known exact constraints, just can't be satisfied with the GGA form. So of course we didn't try to satisfy them because we didn't couldn't. Then there are some others that can be satisfied but not simultaneously. You satisfy one, then you can't satisfy the other. So in fact, how did we choose between those competing constraints? Well, uh, we, we decided that uh, we were going to rely on the uh, exchange correlation hold constraints. And so we, we checked to see which uh, exact constraints on the energy might give us the same functional. And that's how we selected the two competing constraints. Um, OK, so, so this was a kind of transition for us where we we made the transition from relying on the whole constraints, which is the more old-fashioned way, to relying on the, the constraints on the energy, uh, which is the way we construct functionals now. And there's a good reason for making that transition. There are two good reasons. First of all, there are only about three whole constraints. And they're rather weak. And, uh, many, uh, many different functionals can be constructed that satisfy the whole constraints. The, uh, there are more constraints on the, on the energy functional, and uh, so they are more constraining. And, the, and the, the, the more constraints you impose, the more predictive your functional can be, because the more it will resemble the exact function. Uh, I always believe that, and I, you know, I think you know, just in the past few years, I've really been convinced from the work we've done on SCAN that, that that statement is true. The more you constrain the functional, the more to make it resemble the exact functional, the more widely predictable it's going to be. Now, actually, I can make a little, a little distinction here between widely predictive and accurate. Uh, widely predictive means accurate on a large data set, including data sets that you haven't tested yet. That's what you really want a functional to be able to do. You don't, don't want it to just work on the data sets where you, where you know it works. You want it to work for systems and properties that you've never tested before. They're unlike anything you've tested before. And uh, 
that's that's what the satisfaction of these active strengths does for you. It doesn't guarantee that you get the right answer, but it makes the functional much more widely predictive. <clears throat> okay. So So I mentioned before this GGA dilemma, but I'll just mention it again. Uh, I, I think this is one one dilemma here, right? The fact that you can you 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 can't satisfy all the exact constraints with this form, and this is theoretical dilemma. You can only only get around by going to a higher level functional than the GGA. And then there's the, the practical dilemma that I mentioned before. <clears throat> we knew about this, in fact, in 1996 when we published the PD. Uh, with the GGA, uh, making the binding energies more accurate will make the uh, bond weights less accurate. sense was probably a sort of optimum compromise for within the DJ form because it gives it improved it somewhat improved the binding energies and the bond lengths compared to uh, LDA. But uh, it, it, we, we just couldn't go any further than, than uh, uh, with, with the refinements of that form. So, so we have to go to another form. And that's the the meta GJ that I'll talk about today. So meta means a little bit beyond meta generalizing rating approximation. <laughs> Yeah. Did, you, did you say why why the accuracy and the energy and the bond lengths work against each other? Um, it's only true for for this GGA form, uh, yeah. but but it's a little hard to explain. Basically, it has to do with this uh, with this uh, this exchange enhancement factor. Um, I don't know if this will be a satisfactory explanation or not, but it's the best I can do. If uh, if you make the exchange enhancement factor go up faster from from uh, one, then then typically that improves the, that that, that uh, reduces the overbinding and, and improves the binding energies. But then it makes the makes the lattice constants even longer. And so this PV saw uh, is uh, goes the other way. It reduces the enhancement factor at small s. Um, it actually, it, this, this comes from satisfying the other constraint, right? So the other constraint was the gradient expansion, second order gradient expansion for exchange. We, we sacrificed that at PBE for the sake of another constraint. Uh, in PBE saw, we sacrificed the other constraint for the sake of the second order gradient expansion for exchange. And then that um, very, very much improves the bond lengths of molecules and the lattice constants of solids. But it, it, it goes back toward the LDA. You can see it going back toward the LDA. So it's going to overbind even more in the energy. That's the best explanation I can give. <clears throat> so, so the meta GGA let's call this M here. Was 
a, what was our uh, general uh, approach to constructing functions? Add another ingredient and use it to satisfy more exact constraints. So we have to add another. So we want to keep this single integral if possible because that's what makes the GGA computationally efficient. It's one of the things that makes it computationally efficient. You only have to do one integral over the three-dimensional real space and not two or more. Uh, and now we put in uh, a function, a meta GGA function, which depends on the local density n and the absolute value of the gradient of local density, like in the GGA. But we add one more ingredient, which is the orbital kinetic energy density tau. And tau of r is defined to be, you can, you can construct it from the occupied cone-sham orbitals, come over the occupied cone-sham orbitals, one-half gradient of this called the orbital spy i, take the gradient of the occupied orbital, square it, divide by two. If you integrate tau of r, then you can do an integration by parts, and you can show that this is exactly Ts, the non-interacting kinetic energy. Uh, okay, uh, so, so it, what motivates the choice of this ingredient? Well, we didn't have to choose tau, uh, and in fact there are many GJs that use alternatives are, are, that we don't actually use in our work, but that other people you can replace tau by Laplacian of n, or you can replace tau by tau and Laplacian of n. But uh, we prefer to use just tau for two reasons. Uh, first reason is that, that we can use tau to satisfy some exact constraints that can't otherwise be satisfied without it. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Uh, now we can satisfy some exact constraints. That uh, no GGA can satisfy. And then you can't satisfy with the Laplacian of them either. And uh, and why don't we use both tau and Laplacian of n? Well, I guess we could, but uh, that makes a function of too many variables, right? It's a, this is already, even for a spin on polarized density, this is a function of three variables. It's starting to get complicated. You don't want to get lost in the details. So, so we just use tau. To some extent, these two variables contain the same information. Not exactly, but approximately they contain, they contain related information. Uh, where does this form come from? Well, I think it was actually suggested by Axel Becker in the, maybe, maybe even in the 1980s. Uh, and he, he made some functionals that were meta GGAs, but I think he primarily focused on GGAs and hybrids. Um, now, Let's see if we can understand what, what tau can do for us that the other ingredients can't. So, <clears throat> to understand that, I'm going to uh, look at certain limits of tau. Uh, for a one or two electron ground state density, like the density of the hydrogen atom and the density of the helium atom, it's important here that this ground state be spin on polarized uh, for this formula to work, uh, but uh, that's a typical case for two 
one and two electron, or two electron ground states, um, at least. Uh, tau goes back to what we call the von Weizsäcker tau, which is del n squared. Why? Because if we if we only have one orbital shape, we can get the kinetic energy the kinetic energy from that one orbital shape uh, from this formula, and uh, the orbital is the, is the square root of the density in that case, or, or, or proportional to it. And when you take the derivative, you can transform it into this form. So, so that's that's the one and two electron limit, a slowly varying limit. is one in which tau goes to tau uniform or tau Thomas Fermi. Which is one half n times three pi squared n two thirds. That gives you an n to the five thirds, which uh, we can all talk about before. That, that gives you the correct scaling for uh, correct uniform density scaling for the kinetic energy. Uh, so the first thing that you can use tau for is to recognize one electron density and zero out the kinetic zero out the correlation energy for a one electron density. So, uh, so a, a, a constraint, a very simple one that we know, is that the correlation energy is zero for any one electron density. We just use the GGA ingredients. We can't recognize uh, what is a one electron density. But uh, but if if, uh, if tau if alpha if tau is uh, equal to tau Weizsäcker, and uh, if the density is fully spin polarized, so this quantity is one, then we have a a one electron density. Like a density of hydrogen atom, but it could be any one electron density. And uh, we can zero out the correlation energy in our functional simply by using this these, this extra ingredient tau. And we do that. So that's typical of a meta GPA. You can satisfy that extra constraint. And the other, uh, other thing I want to mention is that a meta GJ is a functional that can recognize three different kinds of bonding and give a different GJ like description for each one. So it's, it's much more flexible than a GJ. Uh, and to do that, we define a, um, define a dimensionless parameter alpha dimensionless alpha that equals tau minus tau Weizsäcker over tau uniform. So that's using all three of the meta GGA ingredients because this is tau, this depends on the gradient, the density, and the density, this depends on the local density. And uh, this, uh, this quantity alpha can, can recognize, for instance, single, for a single co covalent bond, like the density of H2, like the, uh, the bonding density of H2. That's a two electron density, typically a two electrons in a covalent bond, single covalent bond. Uh, alpha is just zero because tau is equal to tau Weizsäcker, the numerator is zero. Yeah, zero. Uh, if we have a metallic bond, as we might have in a, in a simple metal like sodium or aluminum, uh, then the density is nearly uniform, so tau Weizsäcker is nearly zero because the gradient is small, but tau is nearly tau uniform, so alpha is about equal to one. And if we have a van der Waals bond, like the bond between two argon atoms at equilibrium, 
alpha turns out to be much bigger than tau. That's basically because tau uniform goes like n to the 5 thirds, and when n gets low, that denominator gets small. So, so we can write uh, so if we use this ingredient alpha in our meta GGA, we can uh, recognize and give a different GGA like description for each of these three kinds of bonds. And in fact we do. So, so in a meta GGA exchange. has to scale correctly, so a possible form of meta GGA exchange energy integral over R, an enhancement factor Fx, which now depends on S, the reduced density gradient like in the GGA, but also on alpha, because alpha has the same kind of scaling as S, and then we have N epsilon x uniform. N. So this has a proper uniform scaling. You can check that as well if you want. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and so in the scan meta GJ, we use this parameter alpha, and the exchange actually has this form. You uh, present an exchange and not the equation. Uh, also, the correlation both in GJ and meta GJ is affected by the new ingredient. Yes, yes. So, so alpha is also in the correlation because uh, if we have a one electron density, for instance, alpha will be zero right? because because for a one electron density, tau is equal to tau Weizsäcker. That makes alpha equal to zero. And so alpha is in the meta GJ, and when alpha is zero, and the system is is, is uh, fully spin polarized, the correlation energy is zero now. So alpha is in both the exchange and the correlation. It's in there in different ways because correlation doesn't scale uniformly, but, but it's in both. Okay, so so I guess I should stop, right? Oh, okay. All right, so let's see if, let's see if there's anything else that I can say briefly. Uh, okay, I guess the last thing, yeah, yeah, so I wanted to mention the constraints. We can satisfy many more constraints when we use these extra ingredient of uh, alpha. And in fact, uh, the scan meta GGA, which I'll talk about in my research chart, satisfies 17 known exact constraints. PDE satisfied 11, SCAN satisfied 17. Uh, in fact, it can satisfy all the exact constraints that a semi-local functional can satisfy. There's not, you don't have that dilemma that we had with GJ that you can, can't satisfy some constraints uh, and others, you have to make a choice between two constraints. All the exact constraints that a semi-local functional can satisfy. And I want to explain what I mean by semi-local functional here, just for completeness. Um, <clears throat> the meta GJs depend on tau, and Tau is actually a non-local functional of the density because tau comes from the orbital. This is related to what Nepo was saying. Uh, the, uh, the orbitals are non-local functional of the density. And so formally, uh, meta-GGA is a non-local functional of the density. But it's computationally semi-local. So maybe I should add that word here. Computationally semi-local. Because after all, it, uh, you only have to do a single integral like in LDA. And the ingredients that you need, the orbitals, the octroid orbitals, are things you get out of any cone sham calculation. So the cost is not vastly greater than, than uh, a GGA calculation. 
cost is maybe a factor of two or three. You can satisfy all of these exact constraints. It, there's only one exact constraint that you can't satisfy with this form that I know of, and that's uh, the exact exchange energy for any one electron density. Uh, that requires real non-locality, and that's the self-interaction correction, which is a whole other story, but I'm hoping that, that, that when we apply the self-interaction correction in the right way to scan, that we'll get a functional that can really do just about everything. <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah, listen, so I should stop. One other thing I want to mention, because we can recognize the van der Waals bond, we can actually give it in, in the scan functional, we can provide a, 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 a description of what I'll call intermediate range van der Waals interaction. Adrian will talk about the van der Waals interaction tomorrow. It has a long range bar that goes one over, like one over the distance to the sixth power between two objects. We can't get anything like that from a semi-local form, but we can get the intermediate range van der Waals interaction that's typically responsible for a lot of the van der Waals binding of one system to another. And that's also an important feature of SCAN. We, it allows SCAN to, to capture a lot of van der Waals bonding, which is just missing in PBE and other GJs. Okay, so thanks. Um, I, I would recommend I would recommend using the best functional you can. So I would say use it. Yeah. It, it. I mean, it's okay, but you may get the wrong answer. Right? <laughs> so 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 if you really want to compare the energy of one phase to another, that's another one of these small energy. In many cases, it's a small energy difference, and you want to use the functional that can best capture that small energy difference, which will probably be a meta GPA or a hybrid functional. Or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, yes. Well, meta GGA, it, it might be, might be six times more expensive than LDA, but it's not a hundred times. <clears throat> if, a, if a functional makes an error, it's often hard to correct it after the fact. It's, so it's <laughs> better to get. Better to use the best function. Yeah. Awesome. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So you said that uh, the J cannot satisfy the both the constraints. And this is impossible in principle, mathematically, or it's just very difficult to do. The bad rules? It's impossible to satisfy by the J all constraints. Oh, 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 I see, all the constraints. It's, 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 actually, it's actually impossible to satisfy some of, the, some of the known exact constraints. An example of one, it's sort of this, the, uh, the example that I gave here is actually an example of that. that we know the correlation energy should be zero for all one electron densities, not just for the hydrogen atom density, but for any one electron density, for H2 plus and a lot of other one electron densities. And it's impossible for the GGA to recognize that, uh, that a density has only one electron in it. Because that's an integral property and the GGA is very, very semi-local, so it only looks at what's at the density and its gradient at each point. It doesn't look at the integral. Uh, but we can, uh, so, so that's a constraint we can't satisfy in any GGA, but we can satisfy it from any GGA. There are others like that too, but that's the, the simplest example. And the last question you said that you made the scan function to satisfy 17 exact constraints, which seem local functional scan. But then you said that this is actually not uh, in local functional. But then how you choose which constraints you need to satisfy? How you choose the 17 constraints? Well, I look at all, all the exact constraints that are known. 
and, and, and of course it depends a little bit on how you want to count them, right? Because <laughs> you know sometimes you know it's not like you can put two constraints together into one. But but I I, I look at I look at all the constraints that I know that are coming out of Mel's work and Elliot Mead's work and the work of other people, and uh, and then I say how many of them can I satisfy with this meta GGA form? And actually, I can satisfy 17 out of 18. And the one that I can't satisfy is the exactness of the exchange energy for all one electron densities. And there's a simple reason for that. The, uh, the exact exchange energy for one electron density. This is for one electron density. is minus the Hartree energy, minus the Hartree electrostatic energy. And this is a non-local functional. It's double integral over R and R prime. That's a non-local functional the density, and you can't capture that with any semi-local form. So, so that's why uh, a self-interaction corrected functional has to be non-local, which will make it more expensive, but also I think make it more accurate. You can do you know any other constraints uh, which uh, should satisfy non-local functions? Uh, maybe this one, but maybe, maybe I don't. One. Maybe uh, maybe Mel knows some. Can you think of other constraints that would require non-local functional to satisfy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Kira. <laughs> okay. okay. What about the stretch H2 case? Stretch H2 case. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So 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 in uh, so so there are there are two two possible ways to make a self-interaction correction that, that look promising at this point. So self-interaction correction is a very old idea. It goes back to the early 1980s, maybe even earlier. Uh, it's been difficult to make it work in, in, in a, a good way for uh, anything that's more complicated than an atom. Uh, but I, I think that there have been some recent developments that, will, that, that are promising. Uh, one development is, is uh, the work that uh, Mark Peterson and Adrian and I did on the uh, the Fermi orbitals, which are automatically localized orbitals. So if you give me a, 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 a co-champ density matrix, I can find localized orbitals from it, which can be used to make a self-interaction correction in size consistent. Uh, the other development is the work that White Tao Yang is doing. We'll talk about that tomorrow on the local scale method, which is, a, which is another way of achieving a self-interaction correction. Now, the difference is that I think White Tao will be able to Dissociate H2 without breaking the spin symmetry. And my way of doing self interaction correction will dissociate H2 correctly to the right energies, but it will break the, the spin symmetry. How bad that breaking will be, you know, whether I don't think it's going to be a kink like you drew. Even the LDA doesn't have such a big kink as you drew. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so so we, 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 can, we can decide whether we need. Uh, Worry about specific. Can I ask also? Uh, I guess I want to sort of go ask you about this levy inequality. Yes. Yeah. In the seventeen. Uh, the seventeen include the, the the versions that Mel talked about today. So he talked about. Uh, I mean, there, there are various versions of the uniform scaling, uh, scaling inequality for correlation. Mel talked about several of them. And the one that we included explicitly, the two that we included explicitly, uh, is non-uniform scaling constraints. And they, they counted, I think, is one, one constraint, and it's among the 17, are that uh, if we take EC of n gamma, n gamma is uniformly scaled density, and we take the limit as gamma goes to 
Uh, infinity, we get a negative constant, except for the uniform gas where we get a weak logarithmic divergence. And low density limit where gamma goes to zero. And this is proportional to uh, gamma. So we did satisfy those two, but there are, there's another version that we haven't tested. That's okay. the one I'm asking about. Yeah, okay. So, so um, I think that's a known thing. So yeah, yeah. So I, so I brought it up with uh, Jadway, but, but, but we haven't actually tested it. We will. Well, that's, that's, that's the problem with counting constraints, right? <laughs> How do you count them? I'm counting these two as one constraint. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, but, it, but that is one that PDE satisfies. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say PDE was bad. <laughs> PDE is probably as good as you can do. <clears throat> So should I wait for your DT straight to the unit? Because I'm working with all the functions. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you using uh, uh, DFT plus U? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, the self-interaction correction may be mimicked to some extent by the U, by, by the plus U. Particularly if you get a plus U from uh, the linear response. Like, uh, if, if it's not an empirical parameter, but it's, it's confusing in advance. It may be, an, the, the DMT plus U may be an inexpensive way to do the self-interaction correction. But I'm not sure. Okay, so I, I need to look into that some more. <laughs> but anyway, I think I think you can, you can do scan plus U. Yeah, I think yeah. And if you do, you'll find that U is smaller for scan yeah. than it is for Yeah. Yeah. The discussion can continue uh, post-session. Uh, just thank you.